Hello, I'm Ben and I work in education at the National Library of Australia. As we begin, I acknowledge Australia's First Nations peoples as the traditional owners and custodians of this land. I pay my respects to elders, past and present, and through them to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. I also acknowledge First Nations peoples as the original astronomers of this continent, something really worth keeping in mind as we look to the skies today. So welcome to our National Simultaneous Storytime event. Each year, the Australian Library and Information Association chooses a book to be read at the same time all around the country. And that means that right now, people are getting ready, wherever they may be, to read this year's book, Give Me Some Space by Philip Bunting. Now you've probably noticed that this year we're not coming to you from the National Library's beautiful building on the shores of Lake Burley Griffin. We're a few minutes down the road. We're on location here on the edge of Canberra at Mount Stromlo Observatory. And that's because one of the things we really like to do for our National Simultaneous Storytime events is to have VIP storytellers join us. And so we're very excited to have Dr. Charlie Lineweaver as joining us as our storyteller today. And he is an associate professor in the Research School of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the ANU. We're gonna ask him lots of questions about what that actually means a little bit later. But simultaneous storytime has to happen simultaneously. So we should get right into the reading, I think. So thank you for having us, Charlie. It's great to be here. Uh, and let's get started with our reading of Give Me Some Space. And this is a book called Give Me Some Space. And it's about an astronaut called Una. So this is space. And ever since the stars aligned to bring her here, Una has loved space. Here she is in a crib in her mobile of all the planets. Her first step was one giant leap. Her first word was gravity. And with each birthday, Una's cakes became ascendingly astronomical. From an astronaut to a space shuttle to the entire planetary system. Now, after a few more laps around the sun, Una is getting older. Una lives in a world of cosmic curiosity and intergalactic inspiration. Hmm. She's studying very hard, and she has a telescope. Una dreams of a life in space. Life on Earth is just so, 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 nah. One day, Una will become an astronaut. She will leave the Earth behind. But for now, she is an astronaut in waiting. Una very much likes the astronaut bit, but she's not so keen on the in waiting part. It will take eons to grow this tall. And here it says, you must be this tall to be an astronaut. And she's not that tall yet. But here's the good bit. Una has been industriously working on an interplanetary plan. Here are the plans with accompanying attire, of course. She has a fishbowl for a helmet and a hand-me-down snowsuit from her cousin Carl. And then she has gloves here and Ugg boots. And today is the big day. Today, Una will finally swap her humdrum, ho-hum life on Earth for an extraordinary extraterrestrial life in space. Of course, once she has packed a picnic and said so long to Neil, her goldfish. Her mission is to find life in space. To find life in space. What a mission. But she'll have to get there first. Attempt number one failed with soda and mint, and she only got up a little bit. She only, what, 32 centimeters off the ground. But later she had attempt number two with a giant party balloon filled with hydrogen, and she got 56 centimeters off the ground. But that's all. Finally, attempt number three, she tried a rocket. And here's Neil counting down. Five, four, three, two, one. Blast off! There goes Una. She's being launched from the Earth out into space, and here's the moon. She's going beyond the moon, flying into outer space. Space was even more extraordinary that, than Una had hoped. There was no so-so, no humdrum, and certainly no ho-hum out here. There's Mercury, the closest planet to the sun. And then there's Venus. It's so hot, too hot for life. And then there's 
Mars, there's no life on Mars yet, maybe, we don't know. And then there's Jupiter, the biggest planet, and Saturn with its rings, and Uranus. Apparently it's a stinky planet like hydrogen sulfide, the, the stuff that smells like rotten eggs, maybe. And Una's mind expanded like the universe with each new moment. Here's what she's thinking. Almost at the edge of the solar system. No life so far. Phew! Uranus was really smelly. And am I alone out here? And did I remember to feed Neil, the goldfish? Maybe there is no life in space. Space and time seemed to stand still as she traveled further towards the edge of the solar system, and that would be Neptune. Neptune is the most distant planet, and it's very cold. It says here, minus 214 degrees Celsius. With all of this astronauting, Una had worked up quite an appetite. So she found a lovely spot on a ring of frozen rocks and launched into her ch cheese sandwiches and astronaut ice cream. Mm -hmm. Astronaut ice cream. And this is the Kuiper Belt. And there she is sitting on the Kuiper Belt, looking around. And in the distance, something caught Una's eye. Shining in the light of a nearby star, that's a nearby star, a tiny blue speck seemed to shimmer as if it were alive. Captivated, Una quickly packed up her picnic and set off towards it. What is that? As she moved closer, Una could see that the shimmering blue planet was orbiting on a tremendous loop around its star. There it is on this tremendous loop going around. It has one moon, and it seems to be covered with a thin atmosphere of gas, an at well, an atmosphere. Could this planet support life? What could it be? Had she discovered life in space? A trillion possibilities rushed through Una's mind as she approached the spinning, sparkling sphere. And here are all the ideas in her head. A trillion ideas. What could it be? And just like that, it came into sharp focus. The blue planet was the Earth. Suspended in space, her beautiful blue home now shimmered even more brightly than before. There's the beautiful blue Earth shimmering. In that moment, Una made the most marvelous observation. There is life in space. We are life in space. And we are all the crew of the most spectacular spaceship in the universe. And there's the spaceship. Everything we need to explore the cosmos is already on board the spaceship. There's fresh water, there's air, there's lots of lovely food, plenty of room, and we have fellow travelers of all species, shapes, and sizes. There's our spaceship. With her mission complete and astronaut ice cream supplies severely depleted, it was time to return home and begin a new mission. We are all traveling through space right now. The Earth is our spaceship, and it's the only home we've got. It is our mission to take care of the Earth so that we can explore the universe for light years to come. And that's the end. And here's space. And there's you now. Well, thanks very much for reading for us today, Charlie. Oh, that was excellent. Um, we've got time for just a few questions uh, from you. And one thing I was wondering is a little bit about you. Uh, what's the best way to describe your job? Are you an astrophysicist or are you a planetary scientist? Or Yes, I'm an astrophysicist, a cosmologist, planetary scientist, and also a, an astrobiologist. But like you, I'm from outer space. Like the whole Earth, we're from outer space. And uh, so that's who I am. I, I spend my time trying to ask questions with the best data we have, trying to ask new questions and answer them with the best data from radio telescopes, from satellites, from uh, uh, optical telescopes. And we're looking for planets. Actually, we've, in the last 20 years, we've found planets around other stars, uh, not just around our star. And this is something we didn't know. That, that's probably the biggest piece of 
progress that we as planetary scientists have made in the last 20 years, and that was, we've, seems to be that when you look up at the, any star at night, any star, there will be some type of planetary system around that star. That's something we didn't know before. We were wondering, are planets unique? Is our solar system somehow unique? But now it seems that planets are everywhere. Every time you see a star, there'll be some type of planetary system around it. That doesn't mean we've found those planets. It just means we do a statistical analysis and that's consistent with the idea that all stars have some type of planetary system around it. Okay, and so you mentioned obviously t using telescopes to gather that, that data. Um, we're here at Mount Stromlo. I brought my own telescope here, um, but I wondered, is, is this going to be good enough or do you have something a bit more sophisticated That's a here? terrible piece of equipment. You bought it too cheaply and you obviously don't know how to use it. No. But, <laughs> no, no, that's a spyglass, I think they call it. Anyway, so uh, yes, we have telescopes here. Actually, about 20 years ago, there was a bur big fire and burned down the telescopes that we use here. However, you see in the background, you'll see some amateur telescopes that are in use. Um, and we have some spectrographs that can tell us what those stars are made of. We have another dome over here that's been burned out. So. A lot of the money that was from the insurance company was made to build new telescopes on top of Siding Spring Observatory that's further to the north that has better seeing. We, asked, we astronomers are very interested in seeing how, how much twinkling, we don't like twinkling at all, sure. and so uh, we want to remove the twinkling. Give Me Some Space has lots of facts about planets and, and rockets and those kinds of things. I wondered if you had a, an absolute favorite space fact that you could share with us well, this morning? The, my favorite space fact is something that I discovered when I was appointed here at Stromlo. I, was, I had a joint appointment with the Research School of Astronomy and Astrophysics and the Research School of Earth Sciences. And so when I, when I started talking to astronomers, it quickly became clear that astronomers think that planets are out there and I had to convince them that the Earth itself is a planet. Now that seems kind of mundane, but it was, I think it's a very profound piece of equipment that you need in your brain. And then when I talked to the Earth scientists, they thought, oh, <laughs> the Earth is a special thing, but it's not a planet like the other planets that we've discovered. So I had to convince these Earth scientists that the Earth was a planet and astronomers the Earth was a planet. So that realization, and that's the same realization that's in this book. You come home and realize, ah, the Earth is a spaceship. It is traveling through space at 30 kilometers a second. It is out there. It is zipping around the sun, just like the comets. Zoom, 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 once a year, 30, 30 kilometers a second. That's fast. Amazing, yeah. All right, here's one. Have you ever eaten astronaut ice cream? I have. About, about 20 years ago, I bought some ast astronaut ice cream, and you can see it in here. They have Neapolitan. They have vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry together. That's called Neapolitan ice cream, but it's so dry. It's, it's kind of Swedish, but it's it's, you got to drink it with some water at the same time because it's not mushy. It's kind of freeze-dried. Okay. Mm. Here's a big question for you, Charlie, and I, I think your ears have kind of prompted this for me. Mm. Um, we talked a bit about the book and discovering life in space. Yes. And remembering that our audience is little people today. Are we alone in the universe? Are we alone? Now, this is a question that... We, I, I just, I'm making a course on this actually. Are we alone? And the, I think the answer is we don't know. We absolutely do not know. But the important thing is we're finding ways to try to answer that question. For example, in finding planets everywhere, we've, it seems to be the case that there are many billions and billions of wet, rocky planets similar to the Earth. Not exactly the same, but similar. And that says, whoa, that means that if life gets started on wet, rocky planets, then life will be everywhere. But we don't know that. We're not quite sure how life gets started. That's one of the things we're trying to figure out. And so lots of chemists are trying to make life in the laboratory. And I go to a conference and they'll say, what's the minimum amount of information I need to stick into my synthetic cell to make it alive? And that's the kinds of questions we're asking. There are chemists trying to figure out. Also, there's how old is life on Earth? And we know that we, we think we have the oldest fossils are macroscopic, they're about three and a half billion years old, maybe 3.7. But there is something called an isotopic fossil, and that might be four billion years old. In any case, life on Earth is almost as old as the Earth itself. And that Earth itself is 4.5 billion years old. That's how old the Sun is. And I should point out that the universe is 13.8 billion years old. So the universe was around for about 9 billion years before there was any Earth, before there was any, uh, any star like our Sun. There were other stars, but not our star. Our star is relatively young. 
Right. Well, we're, we're tackling the big questions this morning for simultaneous story time, but we've, we've, we've run out of time. <laughs> so I think all, it, all there is to say is just thank you so much for your time, Charlie. Um, we really appreciate you reading and answering some or, or starting to answer some of our questions. And uh, if you wanted to uh, continue on with simultaneous story time, there's some fabulous activities on the ALIA, the Australian Library and Information Association's website. And maybe you'd like to just read, um, give me some space again with someone special. So thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye.